everyone. Today we're here to take you on a short trip down memory lane where we'll be reminiscing a bit about the development of Total War Pharaoh and the Dynasties update. Before we dive in into the stories that we want to share with you, which you likely have not heard anywhere, I'd like to introduce myself. Uh, my name is uh, Todor Nikolov. I'm the game director of Total War Pharaoh and the Dynasties update. I've been with the game since its very beginning, the first one in and likely the last one out at some point in the future. With me, I've got a bunch of devs that will be introducing themselves right away, starting with... Hi, I'm Ivan Vupe, Senior Designer on Feral Dynasties. Uh, and this update, I've worked primarily on the Dynasty system, on the update for the invasions, and on minor factions. Hello everyone, I'm Emil Tomov, I'm one of the writers for uh, the entire uh, Feral project, as well as uh, the person who uh, helped out with uh, the text management process. Hi, I'm Teo Kujukov, I'm a principal game designer. I've done a lot of campaign stuff on the base game of Pharaoh, and I led the design effort on Pharaoh Dynasties. Yeah, and I'm Milcho Vasilev, and for those of you who don't know me, I am the bloodthirsty guy that is responsible for almost everything that is surrounding battles, and both Total War Pharaoh and Pharaoh Dynasties. Awesome. Thank you everyone. Now the introductions are out of the way, so we can start digging into those stories that I mentioned we'll be doing. Uh, where do we start? I suppose it's best to, best to start at the beginning. One of the most interesting things back then was actually choosing the historical period where the, the events of the game unfold. One of the things that we knew back then was that at some point we will try to combine Pharaoh with Troy. And actually, this had a huge influence on the time period because we knew that we had to be somewhat limited towards the end of the Bronze Age, the collapse of the Bronze Age, and we decided to embrace that. This also had another interesting impact on the design decisions for the game because this is one of the main reasons why we chose to go with those immortal characters, larger than life ones, because we needed to have counterparts to the characters that we had in, in Troy. All of the people from the Iliad, Achilles, Hector, and Agamemnon, and I won't be listing all of them because plenty of people have done that over the years. Uh, I remember that, first of all, I kind of put together a rough outline of the characters themselves. And most of the people around me back then, they were working on the Mythos DLC. Yep. For, for Troy. You in particular, Vulpe, you were working on Rhesus and, and Memnon. Rhesus and Memnon. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was working on both. Yeah, yeah. you were working on both. Uh, so after the people, the other people uh, joined on the project, one of the things, the first thing that Theo, you did was create, if I remember correctly, those faction identity. Yeah, things. yeah, I, I remember that was the first task I had on Pharaoh. And it was, it was especially fun because I come into the project and I look at all these characters and I know nothing about them. I have no idea who anyone is. Don't worry, we all were like that. <laughs> yeah. So I just did a bunch of I did a bunch of reading. I did a bunch of asking Toro and Emo lots and lots and lots and lots of questions. And then I remember doing the, the PowerPoints where they were like uh, you know created to describe who these characters are, what's special about them, and why would you play as them. And I basically used lots of memes because I figured that's that's the way for people, you know, to try and get my point across. I distinctly remember putting Ramses the third, the man in our shirt. Uh, to be like the world's Muhammad Ali. Like he, he is so young and he's done so well that it, he doesn't just, you know, himself believe he's the greatest. He must be the greatest. It, it's undeniable at this point. Yeah. That's how we started off with him. Yeah, I absolutely. didn't know it was Ramses the third, by the way. I thought it was Ramses the second. And <laughs> we were going to be that. doing the Battle of Kadesh and so on. And I was like, there's another one? Okay, yeah. that's cool. But if you do the Battle of Kadesh, then it must be a draw. Everyone yeah, yeah. wins in that battle. <laughs> according, according, according to them. Yeah. According to this also shows how in history, yeah. the people that are usually the conquerors are more uh, usually renowned and well-remembered compared to some that just kept things together and kept the civilization from collapsing, yeah. like Ramses III did. Yeah, the kings who were just fine. Yeah, he was the okay king. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think we have an okay king in the game. Like, we, we've selected characters that are kind of dramatic. You, we did that, by the way, we inserted some additional <laughs> drama um, by the, what was it, the character matrix? Uh, well, uh, the, the, after Theo completed the, mm -hmm. the uh, faction identities, uh, uh, and those m memes and the pictures uh, helped a lot, by the way, the documents basically contained information that uh, uh, told me what they were supposed to represent in the game in terms of how they played. 
And then uh, I had to make up a character. There needed to be some uh, filling of gaps involved. Uh, the, the main approach that we took with, with Pharaoh was to sort of take the, the, the historical novel approach, which doesn't contradict what is known, but fills in the gaps in a way that don't contradict what is known. Uh, and this includes, for example, the, the whole succession crisis in, um, in Hati, for example, um, because all I had to work with was the family tree. And it, it was a family tree that sort of had, had inherent drama in it, since you have Karanta and uh, Shupiluliuma, uh, who were from two different branches, and one branch were kings at one point, then the other branch became kings. So these two characters uh, were at odds with each other from the beginning. Uh, and then there was Ursu, uh, whose name we know, and nothing else. So we decided to go with Irsu Smash. Yes. <laughs> so basically, this is what we know. There was Irsu, and he did smash he, some yeah, things. Yeah, that's, that's basically it. I, I remember the coolest thing about the character Bios was the, because we you know, used like a template you know, to fill them out, to describe them well. <clears throat> there was one line where Elmo added a little, a little fun fact about each character. That's it. That's it. That's my favorite. Yeah, too. Um, it would be nice to to uh, try and in, in include some of that in uh, in the game itself, and some of it is in uh, in the voiceovers, but uh, which you should listen to, by the way. Uh, play play <laughs> play with uh, with sound on, please. For example, Bay uh, can cook a mean soup because he's been uh, on the march a lot, and uh, Ursu has insomnia. Uh, Shapululiuma uh, uh, can't keep a pet for some reason. They all run away or die, unfortunately. He's very broken up about it. Um, Karunta can't kill a pet. Uh, he, uh, uh, he can kill people. I mean, you all know that, I think. Talsret uh, likes to tell jokes. He's incredibly bad about it, uh, about telling jokes. But uh, Seti laughs uh, nonetheless because he loves her. Uh, Ramses can't keep his drink. These people were basically unknown, even the ones that we have some information on. Um, but we wanted to represent the period through these people and through all the flavor texts that were written as if from the point of view of this period, instead of some academic talk, you know, uh, um, talking in the past tense about this. We also had to learn to pronounce Shupi Luma's name. We called him Shupi. Yeah. Yeah. Shupi was, yeah, it Shupi was, was yeah. absolutely acceptable. And the, the, the people in our Discord uh, uh, call him Super Lama. Which is even better, yeah. Yeah, so that's, that's, that's pretty good. Better. <laughs> Out of our sources, the ones that we used, uh, one of the most important ones in my opinion, and some of, some of the people here were pretty fascinated about it, the Amarna letters. Which unfortunately are called the Amarna letters uh, in, in the game because Amarna is the contemporary name of uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, this uh, is, the city. Achitatan's letters is not... Not yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The I same mean, ring to it. Hmm. Also, it's a it's a, 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 an actual historical source, and it's a pretty rich one. So uh, it 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 was best to to just cite that historical source as is. And the the Amarna letters uh, also helped in fleshing out the characters as actual people, because if you read some of these letters, these people were so petty, sometimes. You know, uh, uh, talking about the, the quality of, 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 uh, uh, of the gold that they were getting. Um, <laughs> of the copper. And the copper. <laughs> the copper isn't mentioned Slightly there. Slightly earlier. <laughs> <Yeah>. Important too. <laughs> that chariot that you gifted me, one of the wheels is off, you know, uh, and kind of sucks. Is that all you got? Basically, you have so much gold. Why don't you give me some? Yeah, Which yeah. is basically... Kings asking for handouts from other kings in, in the exact language that you would ask for a handout, which is kind of ridiculous, but that this is how they communicated, even though they called uh, uh, each other brother by these yeah. uh, highfalutin honorifics, you know. Uh, hey, brother, now give me some gold, please, because I heard that you have a lot. Yeah, and also the tiny kingdoms in Canaan that just go, mighty pharaoh, son of our lives or whatever, send us archers, send us chariots. We don't have any. <laughs> the land is in danger for decades and still we're waiting for your help. And actually, fun fact, I was reading about it. Someone mentioned it on, on Discord, I think, these days, that looking at people uh, right now complaining that the AI is too aggressive, you know, etc. This sounds like some Amarna letters, <laughs> just complaining to the devs. 
Okay, this way, I, <laughs> this way I cannot be like this. I mean, I'm getting wasted. Please do something about it. And yeah, we will try to do something about it. We won't be like Pharaoh. Uh, calling the fans Canaanites? Certainly not. <laughs> some of them might not. like it. Some of them might. I yeah. imagine that some of the letters were like, you know, they send, you know, Pharaoh send us stuff. It's like the 200th time. Yeah, definitely, definitely. <laughs> We've been messaging exactly. you for so long and still you, you ghost us. Yeah. There is not even <laughs> Leaving scene, us on you know. scene, yeah. And, and <laughs> the, the funny thing is that uh, these letters took like three months to go back and forth between these, these people. And so you ask for a handout, three months later, someone says, Scene. Eh, sorry. Bringing this whole thing to life was an amazing experience. Yeah, <laughs> I think there was we had actually had a lot of uh, discussions on whether we should use the real names of the settlements, yeah. for an example, or no or the ones that are uh, f m m famous now. I know that when we were first creating the battle map for Menefer, it was called Memphis. Yeah, and later I thought that. Uh, we need to create a new settlement that is Menefer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This, is, this was a particularly my decision because I looked at the, um, you know, the names on the campaign map uh, and I said, okay, they didn't know, didn't call Memphis Memphis back then. Yeah. It was Menefer. And, but most of the people know it as Memphis. And it was about making a call about something that might not have been important to, uh, to many people uh, from the dev team. But I said, we're going with with Manifer. and and Thebes get becomes Wasset and and etc. This causes a lot of problems because a lot of people <laughs> Lots of chaos, yeah. do not know what yeah. Manifer is. Like perfect <laughs> example from Milchu. Do we need to make another another map? Well, I've also made made some other decisions like that, like the the crowns of Ooh. the pharaoh. <laughs> so and, and Milchu, you have some some <laughs> things to say about it because I really very much insisted we are representing the pharaoh. And you are supposed to be, uh, uh, you know, to feel different and very powerful. This almost godlike being when you when you ascend to that level. And I said, pharaohs have crowns, different crowns. Let's put them in the game. Let's make them visible everywhere where you can see your character. This has an impact, which is also related to the way we um, implemented the bodyguards. Yeah, the bodyguards. I mean, <laughs> it, it all comes together nicely because first nicely. it was we <laughs> want we wanted to make sure that if the pharaoh has one of the crowns, we want to be able to see it in battle as well, and he's wearing the crown. Um, so we had to implement that, and this is something that we didn't have as a working system in the game. So also we had to create it from scratch. Uh, then, then came the request to be able to switch the weapons or the armor or the shields of the different bodyguards, which makes sense. It's awesome. The Pharaoh can choose their own bodyguard. Uh, they can choose if they want to be lightly armored, heavily armored, light shields, big shields, crowns. How many and, entries? And this results thousands. in thousands of entries in into the database. The database yes. Which is amazingly <laughs> interesting something. type of implementation that we did. If we knew from the start that this yeah. was going to be so huge, we might have created a whole system Definitely. and made it work in a different way, but no, we just just, the database just implementations. That. So right now, if you want to add new types of bodyguards, for example, so armed with two-handed axes or something like that, you literally need to add thousands of entries into the database to adjust for every combination because your bodyguards might also have the pharaoh in them who's wearing the crown and wearing this Motors, crown. we're sorry. It's yeah, amazing. We're sorry, we're sorry. <laughs> but it works. It works. It, it, it is works. There. Yeah, it yeah, is yeah, awesome. Definitely. And when you Give your pharaoh a bow and a crown, you can actually see it on the battlefield, on the campaign map. Yeah, so and You can take achieved. sick photos. You can take great photos. Of, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Not Absolutely. only pharaohs, right? Not only pharaohs, Pharaoh. all the generals. All the generals for all the factions. This includes the ones from the dynasties update. This includes the heroes that we added uh, from the Aegeans, like uh, Rezus, uh, Memnon, Ene Aeneas. Aeneas, yeah. All yeah. the guys. Oh, all of them needed to have this. There was a photo awesome. in, on, on Reddit uh, with uh, Euleus with a crown, with, with, with an Egyptian crown. And it's one of the better photos I've seen from this game. We, al <laughs> we also had an awesome bug where all the crowns got worn together. Like just stacked oh, yeah. on top of each other. We had that. <laughs> <laughs> what about when we decided that we're finally we're doing the Dynasty update? Which was, th and this decision was not that, not that long ago. 
and we had to kind of connect the two maps and extend uh, oh. <laughs> extend them further to the east. There's a lot of interesting tidbits in that because yeah. we, we kind yeah. of always knew that we wanted to combine Faro with Troy and things like that. But there was a problem that we didn't know about was that we actually can't expand the campaign map to the left because it starts at zero zero coordinates where the lands of Egypt were and we could only expand it to the east, which produced a huge problem. And we actually had to get uh, our lovely people with R&D involved in this to be able to change the way the campaign map works as a whole, just so that we can expand it to the west as well, so that we can add the regions of mm. uh, the Aegeans and so on. Just a little bit. And these are amazing things to have to do with. It's, it's pretty much the, the map that it is right now. It's pretty much on the maximum size. Th that's why it's uh, around uh, Kefalonia. It's a little bit tight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. Uh, there were some uh, particle effects uh, from Farrell that actually covered most of it. So, so they covered most of your regions, and we had to call R&D. Could you remove them so that uh, I can see where my home province is? And we also expanded it to the east with, uh, with Mesopotamia. And we... Also, by that point, we had received already feedback that, uh, from the players that our battle maps could be a little larger. Oh, know? yeah. This was after the release of Pharaoh. Yeah. Um, we, as the game uh, went out and players played it, they, we, the overall feedback for the battle maps that we received was very positive, except that people wanted them to be bigger because we made terrain and weather and all that sort of stuff be much more important in the battles and they wanted more of it to have more tactical options to outmaneuver their opponents and so on so they wanted bigger maps and at first i remember i was like well no they're big enough <laughs> as they are right now uh, we had them four by four tiles with one tile being uh, 256 meters i believe um, so they were like over a kilometer by kilometer big. So this was a huge battle with, with lots of terrains that you can do everything about it. But people kept asking about it. And at one point I was like, okay, I'm going to try it out, see larger battles and so on, how they feel. And they did feel better. <laughs> <laughs> they, did, they did feel better. At one point I just had to admit, well, damn, you were right. <laughs> this, this does feel better to have them bigger. Uh, we need to make them bigger for the Mesopotamian regions. So we decided that all the new battle maps that we were making, we are going to make them six by six instead of four by four tiles, which does feel actually much better. Uh, How did the level designers and the dressers uh, react to the bigger maps? We're gonna need more time. <laughs> <laughs> bigger maps means there is more stuff that needs to be dressed and adjusted and made playable. So, on. Uh, so yeah, we did have to do a lot more work to make sure that they are bigger. Uh, with that came the problem that we couldn't update the old maps because we have a lot of maps in the Total War Pharaoh game, especially when you include the ones that we imported from Troy, uh, which were still 4x4 four four, uh, size uh, as they were in the original Pharaoh game. This would make it hundreds of maps that needed to be updated. And the update includes not just increasing the size of the maps, but making sure that all the um, passable terrain and the logic for the AI, which the logic for the AI is usually one of the hardest things to add to the maps, is working correctly. And that proved to be a huge daunting task. Also, twice the donkeys on the map. So that might be difficult as well. Or, 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 or the goats. At the end, we'd agree with at least one and a half. Donkeys. And of course, yeah. with everything, that all has to be tested. <laughs> well, yes, <laughs> yeah. it needs to be tested that it, if it works correctly or not. But we did it for the Mesopotamian maps and we were very happy about the results in the end, I think. Yeah, testing, I, m I remember that we had some challenges with our testing capabilities, in particular for the, for the minor factions, because we added minor factions in, in, uh, in the Dynasty update. And by the way, it's, uh, by virtue of uh, Ivan Vupe over here, who just, I remember he came over one day and said, why don't we have minor factions? Why don't we give the players more factions to play with? And I was, you know, sitting like that, I imagine, dumbfounded. And I said, why are we not doing it? Exactly. <laughs> Can you say a bit more about the minor factions and, and the reasoning behind that and what? Uh, sure. I, 
I think I was working on uh, the Dynasty system, and uh, I started playing Rome a little bit again. And I looked at there are a lot more factions uh, there, and I thought, we have interesting factions in our game. Why don't we let people play them? They're going to have interesting starts. They're going to have an interesting uh, diplomacy, and you can feel like being uh, that faction. So th that was the inspiration behind it. Um, I, I, I think it was awesome that also we decided we decided to go big. Because, you know, you think we're going to do my effects. How many are going to do? Like two, three? No, 25. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The battle team was like, okay, and... a lot more bodyguards <laughs> and generals. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. No, they were awesome. Later, later they we, were awesome. <laughs> we saw that there are other benefits, right? Because I wanted to give more starting positions and uh, more variety to the players. But later we thought, oh, we're adding Aegeans. We can add Achilles now. We can add Odysseus. You can play with them. With bodyguards and different uh, weapons that has to yeah, do with shit. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> this I, has happened, yeah. You see, it happened. I remember when we were working on the major factions for, for Dynasties, you know, which were, you know, Mycenae Troy, and I was like, you know, we have so many characters, who's coming in, who's coming out, you know, who, like, how's gonna, how's Mycenae gonna use Achilles, and what are we gonna do? Minor Factions was like a godsend, like, there's Achilles right there, he's playable, done, ready. Absolutely. <laughs> That's what we do. <laughs> we had some, some plans how to involve Achilles in particular before that. Yeah. Uh, but at some point he was supposed to be an NPC. There was supposed to be a, a sort of a dilemma, if I remember correctly, that allows you to, to gain yeah, control yeah. over him. But we did update his model from Troy yeah. before that. So just because we spent a lot of time updating his model, making it look more historical and not this epic figure that is from the Iliad and all that, we knew we had to put him in the game in <laughs> some way. <laughs> and, the, and the minor factions really did solve that incredibly elegantly. We were actually hoping that they would not take that much of an effort to, to implement. And, you know, uh, but I remember at some point I said, okay, I'll be just doing a couple of playthroughs with the minor factions. I had feedback. <laughs> <laughs> and this, this really, uh, mm. this really was, was threatening to, to blow out of proportions because feedback was also coming from uh, other, play, uh, other playthroughs by the QA, uh, for example. And... Of course, people imagine that certain things with a certain faction would be cool, but the truth is that uh, yeah, we, we couldn't address absolutely everything. So what we managed to do, I believe, because I've played at least a portion of the campaign with most of them, we managed to, to make at least the ones that I've played with interesting, at least for the first 20, 30 turns, something like that. And it's very interesting the, the kind of dynamics that, uh, that you can uh, uh, include by including these factions as minor factions because they're more recognizable now. Because the most powerful NPC faction in your playthrough, you can actually, next time, you can go and play with it. And th this is amazing. And uh, uh, not just Alashia, but uh, Ugarit and Karkemish. And Assyria. Uh, I mean, uh, the, uh, the, the pharaoh Assyria, of Egypt yeah. the minor is a minor faction. faction. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. They, can, they can now recruit uh, stronger units. So uh, each of these 25 factions is stronger than it was before and can make uh, your sandbox that much more. Mm. Uh, different. Yeah, Absolutely. but it is all about the sandbox because I mean the battle team again. The first one you can now play with the Pharaoh of Egypt. He has access to the mo some of the most elite units in the game on turn one. On yeah. turn one. <laughs> uh, okay. Which so uh, do we can do this? Uh, I don't know if it's <laughs> some changes that we made, but uh, uh, people th right now I uh, I think seem to think that uh, Merneptah is a lot meaner. He is because yeah. he kicks ass all around yeah. him. I mean. You start with the elite units. This is similar to what we had with, uh, with Shupiluliuma, the, the great king of the Hittites. And I always envisioned this, is, this needs to be a survival campaign, you know, like a horror story. Uh, you need to be surrounded by enemies. This is going to be hard, you know, you have to survive. You likely will not. <laughs> <laughs> but and the first iterations of, of, his, uh, of his campaign was quite like that. Uh, you just go play the game and, whoa, I am getting wasted by all around me. Excellent. And then we put in the game the functionalities related to the fact that he's a great king and he's got vassals and he's got elite units and the powers of the great king. And all of a sudden, you are the great king of the Hittites. No one can oppose you. Yeah, because he had one of the strongest rosters at the start uh, of the game because he had access to heavier units. And we had a lot of problems with... Uh, balancing how light units would fight against heavy units and so on, because we knew that the Egyptians are going to be more lightly armored and uh, the Hittites are going to be more heavy. And we, we needed to 
implement certain mechanics to make sure that those units can fight on equal grounds and have um, equal benefits in certain situations. Uh, the way we were thinking about it at first was that the terrain differences, the weather, of course, they would affect uh, light units much less than they would do heavy. Heavy units are going to get tired, they have to move around. And when fighting on land battles, you could actually outmaneuver them, outflank them. It was easy. But then, some of the most important battles were settlement battles, where the heavy units could just block off certain parts of the map and then you just had to fight them. And they are better in one-on-one -on -one fighting against lighter units. So this was a huge problem. The first system that we tried to make to address this was the armor degradation system that would make heavier units um, lose their armor over time as they were fighting. Of course, it's not his super historic, historically authentic, but it makes sense in a gameplay sort of way. And this proved to not be enough. And at the start, uh, Shupi Lui Luma was still one of the hardest factions to defeat in battle just because of those heavy units. It was not up until the lethality system that came with the dynasty updates that could really now shuffle the balance around those heavy and light units. Because now every blow could be deadly, even if you are armed with a uh, huge bronze-plated armor that um, gives you a lot of protection, there could always be some lucky shot even from a sling that um, penetrates that armor in a certain place and you die. Mm. So this is how we finally managed to shift the balance there a bit. And I think that right now we are in quite a good spot with, of course, some balancing issues to iron out. But finally, I at least believe that we have very good interactions between light and heavy units. Again, with all the weather interactions, the stamina, um, debuffs and so on, and armor degradation still uh, keeps uh, playing that. So yeah, this was a very interesting development cycle that we had around the battles in Pharaoh for the different releases. I yeah, mean, I don't think armor degradation is that you know anti-historical because I remember reading about using bronze weapons. I mean, there's more about weapons, but if you use a bronze sword and you hit a shield, you might bend your sword. Then you gotta stick the thing in the ground and kick it until it straightens out, so you can yep. fight with it again. Good thing that bronze is malleable. Yeah. Because yeah, in terms of campaign and how we managed to sort of maybe keep the effects in check or not, uh, you know, when it comes to battle or when it comes to campaign, um, maybe uh, Teo could talk a little bit more more about that. Uh, how how the, the the campaign systems uh, basically worked alongside or together with well, battle. Well, really early in the project, when we, you know, coming off of the last thing we did, which was you know, Mythos on Troy. We basically defined, we named our enemy, and we called it the effect soup. You know, this is a thing we must all hate. We must, you know, draw all our swords against it, you know, plunge it into it. No effect soup ever, you know, it ruins everything. What is the effect soup? The effect yeah. soup yeah. is having an inexorable list of effects that give plus 5% to this, minus 3% to that, and you can't, like, you have to try and read through all of them, and you get lost and you fall asleep. That's the effect soup, that's the enemy. You know, we, we all hate it. Everyone in this room, everyone hates it. So we, you know, first of all, we decided, okay, let's not do that. Let's try and keep things, you know, significant and, you know, let's limit the use of, well, basically everything, you know, every little effect, every little thing that gives a 5%, we tried, you know, to, see, to be very careful about where to put it, how much to give, you know, for it. And I remember being a little bit, you know, I, I was picking all of the nits on this. <laughs> I, 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 was, I was being the most annoying person ever, you know, caring about all this. But we also tried, you know, to make it easier on the eyes. So we added effects visualization, where we tried to, you know, present effects in a different way and to basically allow us ourselves to clump them up together. You know, if you have four sources of armor-piercing damage, let's just put them all together. Let's let's sum them up. Let's put them in a little list. Or if it's against a specific target, let's add that little target slightly underneath. You know, to mm -hmm. to make mm -hmm. to make it easy to read. I remember working with this system. I remember uh, how we had a guide, how to use it because it was new, and it involved tables and stuff. <laughs> so it so it as was always. it was it was bumpy as usual, but I think in in the end I like how it works. Yeah, it helped a lot with the writing too because uh, uh, you know uh, freeform text uh, when when you describe effects is always prone to uh, uh, to problems because writing functional or instructive text, text that speaks directly to, to the player and uh, explains to the player how the game is played and 
what this thing is, uh, is an art in itself. And uh, we, the writers and, uh, and the, uh, the UI designers as well, were greatly relieved that now it's blocked out in this way because it's uh, uh, a lot more readable and you don't have to write a full-fledged sentence every time when you want to add an effect. Ancient Legacy Hammurabi. Mm. Which is your favorite Ancient Legacy? You have one. Well, I mean, depends if I'm trying to... what I'm trying to do in the campaign. You're trying to have fun and you're, you're, you're trying I to really be happy like with the, the Ancient Legacy. <laughs> I really liked Akhenaten. Of course, everyone Because, does. I mean, it was awesome. You can just take two gods, combine them, get all the effects in your effect soup. If we could have Hammurabi as well <laughs> in the mix, it would have been awesome. But yeah, that was uh, probably the strongest one. Yeah, it's the most it's overpowered strong. thing it's, we have in the game. Yeah, by uh, far. But it's also fun to it's do. It's also it's, awesome. It's yeah. fun to do. Yeah, yeah. It's just like that. Uh, we were at some point discussing bringing all the ancient legacies somewhat to that level, so that you can, you know, feel that they are really impactful. But this was during an earlier version of the of the campaign structure where the ancient legacies were uh, unlocked rather later. Yeah. We had this, we had this. You, you ha in order to get an ancient legacy, you need to be the pharaoh or the great king or the king of the universe, whatever, this supreme leader kind of figure. Uh, but then we got feedback that, uh, yeah, players want to unlock the cool stuff earlier. Yeah. So we brought it much earlier to, to turn 12. And now finally with the dynasty update, we've, we've also included the campaign customization option that says, just go with everything unlocked on, on turn one. Also, the, the supreme rulers are uh, strong enough, you know. Absolutely, they are. It was kind of the point. I mean, if you're ruling over a, like a quarter of the map, you should be, you know, one of the strongest players. Yeah. 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 Or yeah. if you happen to become a, a supreme r ruler by chance, and all of a sudden everyone hates you and wants to take your crown, which is a scenario that can happen right now. It right happens now. right now, <laughs> thanks to the dynasties. Yeah. At first, the idea wasn't that you could become supreme ruler uh, through the dynasty because uh, we didn't, I didn't, uh, want to circumvent the entire legitimacy war system. Now that was very crucial to Pharaoh and their civil war and you know, who's going to succeed. But uh, I received feedback. Feedback. <laughs> feedback gets there. It, it's always feedback, but thank God it's there. It does feel like an exploit, but technically... Rulers in real life also used a lot of exploits. It was an exploit yeah. in real life too, yeah. <laughs> also creates a lot of trouble for you as well. So, so yeah. basically, if you're adopted and you have enough legitimacy to be a pretender, the supreme ruler, the pharaoh, will say, oh, there's my heir. See, he's, he's popular already. Mm, yeah. And you can become a pharaoh without the whole legitimacy. One. Whether you like it or not. <laughs> <laughs> the dynasty system, by the way, one of the, the things in pharaoh that I enjoy the most is the, the level of immersion that... We, we've achieved, especially with the, with the past family trees. I remember that we, when we uh, added the, the family tree on uh, Rome 2 with the Rise of the Republic DLC, I was the person going through all the factions in the game and putting their, you know, starting position family tree, mentioning characters that were dead, putting in <laughs> their children that could grow and become Emperor Tiberius if you play the Augustus campaign for long enough. Remember I did that? Uh, and then Wupa did the same, you did the same for, um, for the Dynasty update with all of the different factions. And it's great to play with the Hittites, with Shupi Wuluma, or with, um, with Assyria, the minor faction of Assyria. All of their major achievements are given as their accomplishments or setbacks. And the best thing about it is that Take a look at uh, the Egyptian uh, 19th dynasty uh, family tree, and you see Ramses II, who is the victor at Kadesh. He famously won that battle, yeah. Yeah, which is the same that you can see in the Hittite dynasty, where the Hittite king also won the battle at Kadesh. He famously won that, yeah. <laughs> and this is just perfect, yeah. <laughs> in my opinion. <laughs> I just have to say that all of that uh, research and, and the putting in of, uh, of, of past deeds and, and, and things uh, was not something that I did, it was something that this man did, uh, as well as the research for the minor, minor factions. Thanks, well, we got to help each other. When I had an idea for the, the dynasty system, we added <coughs> deeds and the deeds give epithets. So I had to give uh, epithets, even though I know that you're never going to see them. Because 
um, th these are people that already uh, passed away the previous great generations of uh, the Hittite uh, pharaoh and the two other dynasties. Mm. I mean, the whole idea about the ancient legacies came in this way, I think, that we were thinking about it. We wanted to mention some of the greatest pharaohs that lived before the time that the game takes place in. Yep. And so this Mernaptan, is... Mernaptan, Ramses III. Ramses III is kind of okay. Mernaptan is very hipster pharaoh. Like <laughs> hipster pharaoh. Yeah. Also, Seti II, I mean, might have been a pharaoh. Telsret, a very important female pharaoh from the Egyptian history. Pretty niche, pretty niche. Amon Mes, who became a pharaoh, then said he became a pharaoh again. He got his title back and defaced everything that mentioned Amon Mes. Because... Yeah, it made our job easier, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's not that they hate each other uh, uh, in, in the game. They famously hated each other. Yeah, and the ancient legacies are exactly like that. We wanted to make references to famous rulers in history. Uh, Especially for the Hittites as well, not Especially just for, for the, the Egyptians. Exactly, and we, we have some for the Aegeans, where we don't know a lot about the Aegeans, like who, they are, who their king was, you know, not a lot of details, just a few names dropped here and there, and I imagine that the ancient Mycenaeans would say, would think, well, who's that? He's the king, we don't need to write his name, I mean, it's... Everybody it's knows him! Yeah, everybody, everybody knows, knows, everybody knows, everybody the, knows king. the king! Yeah, he's on the front page! And we actually had no other option, other viable option, apart from using the characters from Troy. Because otherwise they would have been, I don't know, a yeah. common and yeah. twisted Greek the, name so that it would look... The most mycenaeus. tenuous, you know, uh, the, the, the only uh, actual sort of evidence for uh, Atreus being a, having been a person <laughs> is, uh, is linguistic evidence, basically. Uh, Atarisia was uh, an actual name from the uh, um, annals of, uh, uh, of the Hittites, by the way, because we know about the, the uh, Achaeans from the Hittites, we don't know about the Achaeans from the Achaeans. Uh, they only left like checkbooks and and uh, uh, number of oxen. Yeah, ma ma sort of thing. Ma material uh, records of of, of uh, building materials and and uh, flocks and stuff. So we had to take these liberties, like with uh, Priam, uh, who uh, was supposed to be Piamaradu, you know, the the famous uh, he was. rogue. For a bit. Uh, and then I found this tenuous again linguistic evidence that there was this person who was called Priamua actually, and his father's name. Um, sounded uh, uh, suspiciously like uh, Priam's uh, father's name in, uh, uh, in the Iliad. So we decided that Priam was actually a Hittite vassal and uh, he had bad experience with the Mycenaeans from when he was younger because of the Amaradu. Uh, and then he decided that uh, he's had enough because the Hittites are uh, obviously weak, so they can't protect him, so he needs to protect himself and the people around him. Then come the sea people, for who we know absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. Because it said history is written by the victors. Well, the sea people came, um, they won, only if they and write. they didn't write Elaborate. anything. Yeah. <laughs> only if they could write. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that was a fun thing to design and add to the game. And we knew we, had, we needed to have the sea peoples. because They are kind of the most, most important force in, in this period. Yeah, yeah. All, all we know are a few tribe names and some shapes of hats. Yep, kind of. At least they left the hats. The hats yeah. Because if we didn't have historical reference for the actual regalia that they had and the helms with the horns and yeah. all that, people would totally not believe that this was historical. Yep. Yeah. They look so out of a fantasy novel. What are these Vikings doing in my, uh, in my <laughs> Bronze Age game? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Uh, the theory is like... A hundred years old, uh, maybe more, and uh, you Google them, and uh, so who were they? Where, where they come from? Well, discussions are still ongoing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, th there are theories from from all over the place. That's what I hope I just should have said. Discussions are still ongoing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a work in progress. We'll we'll clear it out in no time. Even the Sheridan, who were the most you know famous ones, yeah, and uh, they are only famous because they got. Uh, absorbed into Egyptian society and uh, there were uh, people started mentioning them more. Because the Egyptians wrote yeah. about them. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And uh, uh, the, for the Sheridans there are two uh, different theories of where they're coming from and uh, the two theories, uh, one is that they're coming from one end of the map and the other is that they're coming from the other end of the map. So 
Oh, great. How does that work? Yeah. Got it all covered, yeah. Yeah, sure. <laughs> it is only in time that... You have to make a decision. Only in time we realized that the, not only the Sea Peoples were coming, but there were also other tribes. For example, the Hittites were all constantly threatened by the, the hillmen of the, the, the Tusker tribe. Tusker, Phrygians too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've covered a lot of the things that we've worked on uh, on Pharaoh. I mean, we have worked on some stuff that you don't know about because yeah. it never made it into the game. Because remember, at one point, uh, chariot racing was almost Ooh, a thing. Yes. Uh, Just for context, at this point, we already were working on the Dynasty update. Oh, yes. And we had a list of player feedback. And we, was, we were kind of anxious on the verge of panicking whether we are going to be able to properly address this, this feedback. And yeah, we, we, were, we will have more factions. This was known. And a bigger campaign map. This was known. And a dynasty system with a family tree with the opportunity to create some uh, you know, emerging narrative. Is and it going to be enough? And the yeah, complete yeah. rebalance of the battles with all the stats and the lethality system. Yes, and, and the question still was, is it enough? Ender chariot racing. <laughs> I mean, it was a fun feature that we developed uh, for a few days with a, a coder and another battle designer uh, trying to make it so that players are actually able to control chariots and move them around w -A -S -D with WSD yeah. controls and race around. Uh, but you kill people with it, right? Yeah, you can still, um, you can still ram get stuff, them. Yeah. <laughs> you can still ram over people <laughs> and get them under the wheels. Just and so on. get in multiplayer and put the the two leaders' chariots next to each other. Yeah, and, and just race. And just we race. we almost had it working. I mean, we technically did have it working. You could take control of the main chariot in a chariot unit and just drive it around. The others would follow. But there were so many bugs and so many <laughs> things that need to be ironed yeah. out with it. <laughs> like, okay, it's very fun to do that, but we should probably focus on the, the horses important didn't things. Like it. Yeah. <laughs> the horses didn't like it. Yeah, one of the things that we also thought, but we never got to actually discussing it properly with, with the programmer, although I think you had a conversation uh, about um, ha giving the players the opportunity to play the, the board game Senate on a loading Ooh, screen. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, me and the lead caller discussed it, you know, because we're, we were both, we're both uh, board game fans, and we thought, you know, uh, you know, that luckily our R and D have optimized the game to reduce loading time, so this wouldn't have worked that well in hindsight. We decided, you know, what would you do while you're waiting to load into a battle? How, play, how about play some Senate? You know, roll, roll some bones, move some pawns <laughs> on, the, on the Senate board. And I think we we had we we spent about two hours, you know, talking about that the hardest thing to do would probably be the AI governing, you know, your your enemies. But would we just make one enemy? Would we make different styles of enemy to play against? <laughs> we went a bit too, too far into it. Yeah, I still think it's doable. But then, if our loading times are like fifteen seconds, when are you gonna play it? Yeah. How about you read some of the stuff I wrote instead? <laughs> did we you can just, did it's you just blame the R and D team for making the loading times too too? Yeah, it's it's too well optimized. <laughs> it, is, it is suffering from success. Yes. Set <laughs> only playable on small computers. Yeah. Yes. We could have a campaign customization option, you know, that allows you to either play Senate on the loading screen or, or make read. Emo cry. <laughs> or make. <laughs> and make Emo cry or read the text and praise Emo. You know. Sure, okay. Um, it is weird how certain things can be easy to develop or at least sound easy on paper, but then turn out to be quite hard. This reminds me of the ladders and the soap. Called ah, yes. pocket ladders that we we knew we wanted to we knew we wanted to remove them. We all know from how they're the called. Game. Actually, <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. we didn't want every unit to just be able to pull their ladders out of their back pocket, place them against the settlement, and climb over the walls and fight and so on. And uh, the technical part of removing the ladders from every unit was very simple because you just remove. They no longer have ladders. Now they have to build the siege equipment that has ladders, and they need to use it. Okay, but then comes all the AI that needs to be updated based on that because the AI can no longer assault just wherever it wants. It needs to create the siege equipment properly. It needs to place the ladders properly. It needs to defend against such ladders properly, uh, especially maneuvering around those settlements that were quite huge uh, indeed. And it required so much work. In Did the it end make the AI the better though? It did. Well, I do believe that we have made a lot of improvements on the AI and how it behaves in settlement battles. Uh, even though there's always room for improvement, especially yeah. when it comes to stuff like AI, it still was quite a daunting task. 
but I'm happy we did it because it does feel much more authentic like that. It, I, I remember the moment uh, distinctly when you know sieges you know got changed to this no no more pocket letters, and defending them was kind of too easy because we also had flaming arrows. So the enemy builds siege equipment and you just light it on fire. And if they didn't build enough, siege is done. Good. You know, too too much simulation. <laughs> One of the things that were, was reported if, uh, when we were doing these uh, preview battles uh, that we prepared before the release yeah. of Arrow as part of the marketing campaign, uh, some people reported that uh, flaming arrows that are shot by the attackers bounce off the walls and they could set, <laughs> set their engines on fire. <laughs> I think we fixed that. I yes, we, we did fix, we did fix yeah. it before release. But before the game release, you would almost always light up your own siege equipment on fire. <laughs> yes. Because even if you were just shooting at enemies that were on top of the walls, some of the arrows would bounce off the walls and hit the, the ground, the grass that is under the, the walls, which would light on yeah. fire, which would start a fire, which would immediately almost the ignite your own <laughs> siege equipment, <laughs> making it impossible to attack the settlement. So yeah, using flaming arrows to attack was impossible at some point. Fire was, is, is fun to have, in my opinion, as a player. Oh, it, but it as a developer, easy. I know that uh, making the AI understand that it's on fire. AI, I remember one of the weird bugs that we had was that, so for a unit to know that it's on fire, it needs to have like at least a few entities taking fire damage. But sometimes it would be so that there's just this little, one little bush that is on fire. The unit is right next to the bush. And there is this one person who is getting burnt <laughs> by the bush. And he's getting, just one person is getting burned. And, but the unit would like, ah, this is ignorable damage. I don't care. So they would just remain like that. And this person <laughs> would burn and die. Yeah. <laughs> Fall down the ground. Die. But then the AI decides that, well, my unit has now broken formation. I need to reform and adjust the formation. So another person would take his place <laughs> next yeah, to the turn. burning you, bush. Go to the, go to the fire. <laughs> who yeah. would start taking fire damage. But again, for the AI, it would not be enough fire damage to do something about it. And the unit would remain there. So this person would die. <laughs> and then the next, and then the next. We recorded uh, the, the, the people screaming uh, who are oh, on fire. Yeah. 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 So it, it was done in-house. If sometimes you think there is something wrong about the game and you need to feel good about death's suffering, you can just light some people on fire and you can hear our screams. Yeah, you hear yes. us screaming. <laughs> <laughs> I distinctly remember when on our previous office that we worked from a couple of years ago, uh, we had this huge balcony at the top of a building in, um, in, a, in the business park over here in Sofia. So we would go out uh, uh, you know, get arranged by the, our audio team on the this huge, huge balcony at the top, and we would be zombies or charging Vikings or you know barbarians just taunting the enemy, etc. Uh, chanting, it, chanting, yeah. 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 You just go out there, you you just yell and roar and scream and whatever, die in agony all over. And I remember the one during one of those sessions, I got a delivery, had to go to the um, to the ground to pick it up, and you're uh, I'm out there be in front of the building. And you can hear a huge crowd of people <laughs> just roaring, really threateningly. And people on the streets are like... <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure security came at one point. Security, yeah, yeah, there was, there was, security, yeah, security, security came. came at one point. And said, What's going on here? It's okay. Everything is under control. <laughs> By the way, one of the uh, ideas that we had uh, and it made uh, its way into the game was the thank you video. Yeah, yeah. that you might have seen if you have uh, won a campaign <laughs> and if you have opened the, the video player in the, in the main menu. Uh, and this was actually the video that we're having these monthly meetings where we get together and we, we talk about things and usually I make magnificent presentations, etc. And these meetings would start with that video. Yeah, this was the opening yeah. video of the, the meetings. opening video, exactly. <laughs> We've seen it for years. But we made it better. <laughs> and this was again an idea by uh, Ivan over here. <coughs> who just said, I want to have this video in the game. Why don't we put it in the game? And again, just like the minor factions. Of course, why not? Yeah. Why are we it, not funding this? It was this? already there. Yeah, absolutely. Of course, it took some additional work. We had to be perfectly synced yeah, about right. it. Uh, you know. It always takes additional I, I, work. I thought it was uh, going to be easier when I uh, suggested <laughs> it. <laughs> then I realized it's not that. But I'm really glad we did it and I would, would do it again. This is, one of the, this is one of the important things of game dev. You always think it's going to be easier. 
it's never easier. Yeah, that's the there's that's, always that's other the designer stuff brain you when about. you descend from the heavens and say, make it so. But then you have to be the one doing it. And you, you sort of think to yourself, who thought of this? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, it was me. I mean, yeah. it's important to distinguish the ideas that um, are going to bring a lot of value into the game, even mm. though if they are a lot of work. I remember for Pharaoh, we decided that we want to have match combat animations for all the units and not just the generals and something like that we had in Troy. We needed to have it for all the units, which means that we, we, need, we need to create tons of new match combat animations both killing animations, draw animations, and so on, which involved a ton of match combat um, mocap sessions that we needed to do. There is a particular memory that springs to mind, and it's related to um, the name of the unit, Agamemnon's like uh, guards. Uh, they had a particular like, idle animation at some point. Oh, the was scratching. The scratching animation. <laughs> scratching. So you have, you have these people, uh, you know, really imposing individuals, heavily armored and heavily armed, with the Dendra armor, I believe, or some version of it. And Which is not a Dendra armor, but that's... Yeah, we'll, we'll reach <laughs> to that point. That's my shortly. bad. Should have checked that. <laughs> the point is that you, I'm, I'm watching there. Uh, they're just the unit in the game, and I'm thinking that it, it, something is off. And all of a sudden, I realized that all of them are crouching there. They're behind, <laughs> kind of like that. Like in unison? No, not really, not but in unison. they apparently have some sort of, of bugs, literally, like... I don't know, lice or something like that. They keep Quite on common. scratching themselves. Yeah, they're doing it unethically Very too much. Frequently. <laughs> I mean, so you know. the, idea, the idea is we, we had to do a lot of um, new idle animations for the different units and so on. And there would sometimes be just like a little stretch like that, a little bit uh, moving yeah. with the hand. Uh, sometimes it would just be a little scratch on the back. But we didn't, we didn't adjust <laughs> the right amounts of mm. how often certain animations could play. And when we initially tested it, we tested it with the low-level units, that low-tier units that are usually pretty much dressed in rags and Perfect. don't have, don't have such elite armor or anything like that. And you would see them scratch themselves from time to time. And this kind of made sense, but then the animations, like uh, for example, if a soldier is uh, armed with a sword and shield, it doesn't matter what tier it is; they are going to reuse the uh, animations that are that they are using. So then you see Agamemnon's tier 5 elite guard units, or fully the Pharaoh's <laughs> elite king, elite units, fully armored in the best possible armor for the era, for the era with all colored and those intricate details on it. It's fine, it looks amazing. And they're sitting there doing the same animations. They must have caught it from the young spears, I, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> yeah, in the battle. It just looked so awkward. <laughs> Yeah, and about the Dendra armor, initially we included it as a unit name, was it? So the Dendra armor is a very famous archaeological found that we have from the Bronze Age of this huge... Uh, it's the full plate, yeah. Yeah, almost. Almost Bronze full plate, Bronze, Bronze Age full plate armor. Yeah. yeah, that was called the Dendra armor because it was found close to a village called Dendra, I yeah. believe, in a tomb near a village called Dendra, which at one point were like, well, they would not call that armor a dendro armor. They would <laughs> just do call we it armor. <laughs> they would just call it armor. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's yeah. this, this actually uh, comes the same with the um, term that we usually have in all the Total Wars about the Pyrrhic victory, where if you won, if you won a battle, but you've had a lot of losses in this battle, it would appear as a Pyrrhic victory, which is based on a famous battle that happened in ancient Greece. A long, long time ago. Yeah, a king named Pyrrhus. Actually, uh, not that long time ago. Not, no, because no. the events in Pharaoh take place before that. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. The we, we had to search through yeah. history about yeah. other yeah. battles that were. Done. I was incredibly relieved for this with this bit that there is actually another term for Pyrrhic victory before the time of Pyrrhus, and I was okay. Goddamn victory! This is going to be it. And so, so a few people recognized it online, and I was yes. For all of you asking, because I, I think I saw something on Reddit, uh, uh, I got a Cadmium victory against like 6,000 people uh, and so on and so forth. And someone uh, below that was, are there any Pyrrhic victories in the game then? <laughs> <laughs> there are. You're looking at one. But don't... <laughs> I never had a heroic victory on, on Pharaoh. I guess this speaks a lot about my Must be a skill ability. Issue. Yeah, no, probably. so it's, it's not just that. The, to get a heroic victory, <laughs> you need to be outnumbered. You need to 
beat the odds and so yeah. on. You do good and you still and, and, and you still <laughs> need to have a certain amount of uh, units that are attacking you and so on. Because if there are like below ten units that are attacking you, you know, you only have three units. It's still quite heroic, but it will not count as a heroic victory. We might need to do a bit more work on how exactly it is considered a close victory yeah. or decisive victory or heroic victory. Because there have been some victories that I've got that are depicted as a close victory, or I've just stomped out. Or just make me, make me paraphrase some of the victory screens to just be, well, that was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> a pretty good victory. An okay victory. Okay. Thumbs up. By the way, a little interesting tidbit. Uh, how um, experience works for generals, it matters whether what type of victory you get. So for heroic, you get like four times the normal uh, amount of experience. Oh, there are a lot of okay. Th this changes mechanics. completely the way I play Total War. So that <laughs> knowledge, you know, really only really take a maximum of, of three units in battle and win against twenty, and you're set. It's always <laughs> great to to watch other people uh, play uh, the the Total War battles, like uh, the Adventure Gamescom. Uh, something like that. We we would allow people to play the game in, in Sofia. Oh was, yeah, we did an was event last in Sofia. Year? Yeah, it was last year. Yeah, it was oh, last, last year. year yeah. Yeah, 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 it was last year. We did last summer. We did uh, an event like that. It was pretty awesome. We were showcasing the settlement of Menefer and how you can light it up on fire. The of course, most of the players just wanted to do that instead of <laughs> because yeah, they were at a convention. They don't really just want to play the game the way it's meant to be played. They just wanted to yeah. light things on fire. Almost, the poor laptop that we were running yeah, it on it up was on fire, struggling yeah. after a whole day of a huge settlement like Manifair being lit up on fire. On ultra settings. No, not all players are like that. Some have absolutely no idea about what's going on. There was one guy who thought we were doing a casino game. Oh, because okay, the feral theme. Yeah, because we had uh, <laughs> on the convention we had uh, the golden like pyramids, the, the whole <laughs> temple set up that was like behind <laughs> us, and if we were looking like we were at a tomb that is a pharaoh's tomb and so on, and for some reason this is very associated with casino games, yes, and gambling. Okay. Some people coming that wanted to gamble. Uh, <laughs> 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 they wanted to bet on the battles because they were. We had those huge screens that uh, would depict how players are playing uh, the battle real time. Like someone yeah. would be playing uh, the, the battle of uh, Manifair, as I yeah. said, and it would be depicted on those Putting 20 screens. on Ramses. <laughs> they wanted to bet on the battle. So. Yeah. <laughs> Only in Bulgaria stuff. <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing. <laughs> I think I'm most proud of us uh, managing to, to release the Dynasties update, get it out there, and then to see the reactions of the players. Like There are a lot of people praising the update and saying that Finally, this is the historical Total War title that they have been waiting for. And there are still a lot of things that we want to fix, but we're making great progress. And it's amazing to see all of those comments, all of the po positive reviews, all the feedback coming from the press as well. Now is the moment to, to thank uh, all uh, the people that are above us and that believed uh, in the game itself so that we had the opportunity to actually work on it, pour our hearts into it, and, and finally release it to the players. And uh, with that, I think we're ready to end it. I want to thank you for watching this video. Thank you for playing the game. Thank you for all the feedback that you're sending us. And keep on doing that. And we'll see what we can do about it. Have a great day. <laughs>